State calls Detective Kelly Otis. I do. for a moment we're having another technical difficulty <clears throat> I thought it happened when I started examining witnesses Please state your name for our court record. My name is Kelly Otis. All right. And you are a detective with the Wichita Police Department. I am. And you were assigned to uh, be involved with the uh, cold case investigation and review of the Vicki <coughs> Wagerly man, uh, matter. Yes. And what was the date of her death? September 16th of 1986. Okay. Go ahead to the next picture. Now, how long have you worked as a detective with the Wichita Police Department? I've been a detective since 1995. And prior to that time, you were first employed as, a, as an officer, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. How So when did you start that process? 1985. And you are currently assigned uh, to work homicide cases? Yes. And how long have you worked in that capacity? 1997. And when were you assigned to be part of the BTK task force that uh, investigated and, and did the cold case review that we have uh, been speaking of here today. March of 2004. In becoming the uh, detective who was responsible for the Vicki Wegerly murder uh, evaluation and review, did you have an occasion to, of course, learn where she was murdered? Yes. And where was that? At her residence at 2404 West 13th here in Wichita. <laughs> Thank you. There is a, a photograph behind you and that uh, shows the front of that address. Is that correct? That's correct. And that w is also a photograph that was taken uh, at the time that uh, police were called to that home. Yes. All right. Can you just uh, briefly describe for us how it is that police did come to be at that home? On the morning of September 16th, 1986, Bill Wagerly, Vicki's husband, came home from lunch. About 10 till 11 that morning, when he arrived home, he found their two-year-old son uh, in the living room area of the house, unattended. Uh, Mr. Wegerly found that to be unusual because, as he would say later, that was not one of his wife's normal practices or actually any practice to leave the son home alone. Uh, Mr. Wegerly quickly walked through the house, didn't find her, noticed that her car was gone when he pulled up at home and assumed at that point that maybe she had to run a quick errand or run to school to do something for their daughter who was attending school at the time. Uh, Mr. Wegerly had a lunch break uh, and had to return to work. He waited for quite some time, uh, up to approximately 45 minutes to an hour, uh, waiting for his wife to get home, uh, becoming more and more concerned about why she would leave the, the young man home alone, the boy. Finally, he walked into the bedroom um, which he had walked by before but had not gone into, and found his wife's body in the bedroom on the floor. Okay. He then called 911. Right. And uh, EMS responded, is that correct? Yes. And actually part of that team, uh, one of those uh, team members, uh, who uh, you didn't know at that time, but uh, is your wife currently, is that correct? That is correct. 
Netta Sauer Otis. Yes. All right. So she is one of the uh, uh, team members that actually, as we've seen on television, was bringing out uh, Vicki Wegerly at that time. That's correct. So you have also a personal association with this case and concern about it in terms of having some knowledge even before you were assigned to this task. That is correct. All right. Now, in the follow-up review of this as a cold case, uh, something that's already been discussed, once Rader was arrested, each individual detective who was assigned a particular case had the occasion and opportunity to talk to them about the specifics of their case because they were familiar with that case. Yes. And you did that with Raider. I did. All right. And uh, in that, were you interested in finding out from him how it is that he selected Vicki Wegerly? I was. Right. Tell us what he told you. Raider said that he uh, picked Miss Wegerly as a victim, a future victim, simply one day when he was driving by their house and saw Vicki walk outside and get into the car. And did you ask him further questions about that? I did. And what did you ask him? I wanted to know if he had ever, uh, during the time after he picked her out, uh, during his stalking time or his trolling time or, or whatever he referred to it as, if he had ever tried to make contact with her in a public place, like in a grocery store or in a church uh, or in a public place of business, to get more information. And he said no, he did not. The only, the only stalking he did of her was from basically from afar. Uh, watching the house, paying attention to her habits. Uh, he had no personal contact with her up until the day that he killed her. In fact, one of the things that happens when you're looking at a cold case uh, would be a fair statement that, you know, in almost in, in uh, attempt anything that uh, you can think about or remember, and, and you get num numerous reports and then this investigation, numerous tips, etc. And those are followed, and, and, and you did some investigation regarding maybe things that people may have seen that uh, would indicate who her killer may have been. Yes. All right. But as it turns out, uh, there is one killer in this case. Yes. I want to show a photograph behind you. Uh, this is a, is a picture. It's a, it's a crop from a larger family picture, but this shows uh, uh, Vicki Wagerly in life at 20 years 28 years of age. Yes. Right, thank you. Go ahead. Now, did you have some uh, question in your mind about how long he'd actually watched Vicki Wegerly? I did. And you asked him about that? I did. What did he tell you? He said that he had uh, normally, normally in, in his uh, statement, he would spend about three weeks of stalking, of surveilling his victim. He could not remember exactly in the Wegerly case how long he spent watching her and her family before he killed her, but he thought it would probably be around the normal for him, which was around three weeks. And I think Detective Ralph uh, shared with us that part of it was that he would, like, maybe stalk someone else at the same time. Yes. And, in fact, in the course of all the interviews, it was learned by each of you who interviewed him that he was constantly stalking people. Constantly. And one of them was uh, Vicki Wegerly, who lived in that home uh, with her family. Could you uh, tell us who's in this picture? The family photo shows uh, Mr. Wegerly on the left, uh, daughter Stephanie at the top of the photo, son Brandon at the bottom, and then Vicki on the right. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, please. Now, as you've already indicated, now uh, Bill Wegerly was actually the same age, and I think their birthday was one day, is one day apart. They were the same age. And he was actually at work at the time she was murdered. Yes. And as you've indicated, he came home for lunch. Do you have any idea approximately what time he left that day? Around, he came home around 10.45 to 10.50. He left work about 10.45, and it was a short drive. Okay. And it was, a, it was a little while later before he found her. Yeah, it was about 45 to 50 minutes. And he, he had, I think, said in his original interviews that he played with his son for a little bit yes. and kind of wondered about things. He, he took care of Brandon for a little bit, uh, had a quick sandwich, and tried to figure out where Vicki might have gone. Uh, and depicted here is Stephanie Wagerly. She was nine years of age at the time. And uh, where was she at the time? She was attending elementary school, was in school at the time. And actually, the morning that her mother would murder, the last time she saw her mother uh, alive 
was when her mother dropped her off at school that day. Yes. Go ahead. And in this photograph, we have a picture of two-year-old Brandon Waverly, and he was actually, as indicated there, while Vicki was murdered. He was present. And, in fact, uh, Rader mentions that to you, and where, what, how does he describe <coughs> where uh, Brandon is? In the interview, he said that uh, Brandon was in a playpen. Uh, there was no playpen depicted in any of the crime scene photos from 86. Uh, later, when we would search Raider's property and find his uh, mother load, uh, we would find a written description of the Wagerly crime uh, in which he went into more detail than what he went into with me and, and myself and Detective Gouge. And in that document, he described the son as being in the play area, which made more sense, probably an area of the living room with some toys on the floor or something. Okay, but it's no doubt in the course of your interview and the following investigation that Rader was very well aware of the presence of a two-year-old while he murdered Vicki Wagerly. That's correct. Now, going back a little bit to your discussion with him about how <coughs> he, uh, he stalked or trolled uh, Vicki Wegerly, uh, there's a screen behind you. It, how, what does he tell you about that? He mentioned that uh, during his stalking of her, uh, there were times when he would go by the house and would actually hear a piano being played inside the residence. Uh, Vicki apparently was a quite good piano player. There was a piano in the house and she would often play the piano. Uh, Mr. Rader said that he heard that piano several times and therefore nicknamed her PJ Piano. Okay. And because uh, he kind of thought that was a good code name for her? Is that he, what he thought that was a good code name, yeah. And uh, there is a, a photograph of her piano uh, as it uh, appeared in her home at that time. Okay. Yes. Now, did you ask him about uh, how he managed to uh, get into the home of Mickey Wagner? He told us that he used the telephone repairman ruse. Uh, he had a hard hat, a yellow hard hat. He was able to stick a Southwestern Bell logo on the front of the hard hat to make it look official. He had a fake identification, which he would talk about in his writings, uh, that he made from a business card and uh, was able to get into the home as a telephone repairman. And he refers to it as some type of a boogie hat or a bogey yeah, hat? I don't know what that means. I have no idea. But he was telling you how it was. It, was, it, ha it opened a lot of doors for him. He, he right? said that his, his telephone repair ruse opened a lot of doors for him. Go ahead. And this would be the front door that it opened for him on that day? Yes. All right, and this is the front door that opens into the living room area, and we can see a, a toddler, uh, a toy there, perhaps being used uh, sometime by uh, Brandon Wagerly. Go ahead. Now, when he was telling you about this, he also uh, let you know that he still had this emblem. Yes. Was keeping it. Yes. And he referred to it at, where he kept it as his what? His lair. The it's BTK lair. lair, as he called it. Now, so when you had the opportunity to start searching through his stuff, are these the items that you found that he had kept? Yes, and, and the, the one on the left, the logo, appeared to be a sticker, a transparent, clear sticker with the logo on it. Uh, the paper behind it, it looked as if the sticker had been peeled off at least once, probably more. And then when he was done with it, he would put it back on the backing so that he could keep the sticker there. Okay, and this, the other, on the other side is a cutout of a... Oh, it looked, appeared to be the cutout of a, of a telephone book cover, maybe. Okay, go ahead, please. And then also, uh, is this just a front cover of that? It was. <laughs> it was uh, apparently used as part of his telephone repair ruse. He would have that with him, a repair manual, to make him look legitimate. So these are materials that he didn't throw away. He kept for he, his memorabilia. He did keep them, yes. Go ahead. So on this day, uh, he indicated to you that he actually heard the piano on the day that he was going, the morning he was going to kill her. He said he heard the piano as he approached her house. Uh, <coughs> like with the others, 
uh, of course, uh, prior to this time, we don't, we don't know what conversation may have taken place with these victims and their killers. No, I don't think we do. And their killer, excuse me. But because of Raider's interview, he, uh, he attempted to describe, at least in his words, how those conversations went. Yes. And he discussed with you a conversation that he had with Vicki Wagerly. Yes. Can you tell us uh, uh, about that? He, he generalized saying we, he made small talk with her. He was able to talk his way in with his outfit and had a briefcase with him that he had a, a what he called a headset in his writing, uh, making me believe that it was probably one of those old-fashioned uh, headsets that phone repair guys would use where they would clip on with alligator clips to the wires. Uh, he told her that he needed to check the lines. Uh, during our discussion, he said she let him right in. Uh, he found her phone in the, in the dining room area, began messing with the box, the telephone jack, uh, as if he was looking to find a problem with it, made small talk while he was doing so. Uh, in his written document, it goes into a little more detail about his thoughts at the time uh, and what he was planning to do. Okay. What does it say? As he was, uh, according to the written document, as he was making the small talk with her, uh, he was trying to decide whether this was a go or a no-go in his words. Uh, he also describes in the written document not getting in so easily. Uh, Vicki, according to the document, had several questions for him at the door. Uh, the Wegerleys had a, a a dog in the backyard, and uh, at one point Vicky wanted to let the dog in the house so that Raider, the phone repair guy, could go to the backyard. However, he was able to, to talk her into leaving the dog in the backyard, and he would check the lines in the house first. So when he initially is talking to Detective Otis and Detective Gouge, he doesn't uh, portray Vicky as, as having that much problem. It was an easy deal for him to get in. He, it, it seemed much easier in our discussion than it did in his written document. And his written document uh, is indicated to have been written closer in time to the murder. Yes. Now, this photograph behind you is also taken uh, uh, by crime scene investigators at the when they were called to that home. Yes. And this shows her dining room and her telephone uh, in that dining room. Is circled there. Yes. Thank you. Go ahead. So he tells her, oh, well, the phone's working, and then what does he do? He uh, states that in his bag he had his handgun, which was a semi-automatic handgun. He pulled it out, uh, pointed it at her, and told her, let's go back to the bedroom. Uh, he said in our interview that he, uh, she expressed some concern about her child. Uh, he was able to control her by fear of the gun, and get her back to the bedroom. In fact, he told you that she said, how about my kid? And he says, I don't know about your kid. Exactly. And she, he, she also made an attempt to try to get him to understand her husband was coming home. She made several comments to him about uh, my husband will be either coming home or calling any minute. Okay. And Raider said, well, I hope not too soon. He said, I, I hope he doesn't come home. And this crime scene photograph, also taken at that time, uh, basically is a view of into the entrance of the Waverly bedroom. Yes. All right. So if you're walking down the hall, and if the individual's not like right on that portion of the bed, you're not going to see much that unless is correct. you actually go in the room. Yes. You would, where her body was positioned, which I think we have photos of, you would have to actually enter the bedroom uh, a few feet to see where she was laying. So even though there was. Uh, Maybe, unfortunately, some speculation about uh, him not finding her, Bill not finding her for some time. When you look at this situation and as a cold case detective and looking back at these photographs, it's not so amazing that if she was not right there, he, he wouldn't have seen her without looking around that No, that, that was understandable, yes. Go ahead, please. Now, he wanted to rate her, meaning he, wanted to let you know uh, the materials that he used at that time. And what did he tell you? He said that he was experimenting with some leather laces. They, they look to be leather boot laces and that go into work boots or hunting boots. And he made that comment uh, at the bottom, leather up, you know, and, and no, I don't know, so I don't know. I'm not sure what that means. 
And so Annie describes it as experimenting. Is this kind of the manner in which he spoke? Yeah, to he you? was Mr. Mr. Rader was very nonchalant, uh, far more than I ever expected. He was. Uh, it was like we were talking over a, a coffee, as if he was relaying a fishing story. And and he expected you to know what leather up meant. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. going to uh, put on a screen. It's a graphic photograph. Uh, actually, there are three photographs in one slide depicting uh, just the feet and the wrist of Vicki Wegerly. Okay. Now, these were taken at the time of her autopsy and show the bindings uh, on each of her wrists and also the bindings of her ankles. Is that correct? Yes. And those, uh, of course, were maintained in evidence, but uh, this is what he was referring to when he spoke to you as leathering up? Uh, apparently. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Of course, you continue discussing uh, the details of this, and what does he tell you? He said that uh, after tying her ankles and her wrists, he put her down on the bed. Uh, however, the, the bindings on the wrists came free. Either broke out of them or got, got out of them, or they came loose and started to fight with it. And this is a, a view of that bed. And the purpose for showing this photograph, a crime scene photograph of the bed, uh, what was the purpose of taking this picture, you think? Well, as you can see in the bottom right of the photograph, the comforter of the bedspread is messed up. That's a water bed, and you can see that the comforter has moved. It did appear to the investigators in 86 that there had been some type of activity on the bed. Okay. And Rader then confirmed that to you? He did. By saying... Uh, some more things in describing their uh, fight, is that correct? Right. And what did he tell you? He said they rolled around on the bed. He was trying to gain control of her again once she got loose of the wrist bonds, uh, and that they ended up on the floor. Uh, and that is a quote from him. She was fighting for her life, and he was trying to take her down. So, again, he recognizes uh, the fighting that she knows that he's trying to kill her. And even more so in the written document. Is there something that you recall that from that document related to this? In the document, he makes a, uh, one of his portions of it is that uh, when he had her on the bed, he pulled out his strangler rig, and that once she saw that strangler rig, she began to pray. Go ahead. And so she was praying in this bedroom, and uh, this uh, shows basically the foot of the bed? Yeah, but that's actually the left side of the bed, and then the foot of the bed would be here. Okay. You can see the, the dresser with the television and the other dresser to the, what would be the right side of the bed, if you want. Okay. And there is a, a pointer there, a laser pointer right there. Yes, Could you kind of show where her body would, was basically located? It doesn't especially. show in the photo, but basically it's in this area here. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, please. Now, he described that fight. In fact, she did, uh, knowing that uh, he was trying to kill her, she, he describes it as fighting like a hellcat. Yes, that's how he described it. And when he was talking to you, you talked to him after uh, Detective Clint Snyder had talked to him about Kathy Bright. Yes. And so when he said the word, she fought like a hellcat too, he was referring to Kathy Bright. He was, and, and he would add that she fought actually, Vicki fought harder. Now, and when he told you that, he also mentioned to you another little problem that she presented for him. And what was that? He said that during the fight, she nicked him uh, and indicated that she had scratched him. And he had said on his face, uh, in his written document, he documented her scratching him on his neck. All right. In fact, he, uh, he s said something to you on the order that you might be able to see it, I think. He, he actually asked me in the interview if I could see. Apparently, he thought he had a scar. I couldn't see anything where he was pointing. Okay. You've uh, attended quite a few autopsies in the course of your uh, work as a homicide investigator. Yes. And you've seen uh, evidence from individuals who have, have been attacked and indicated things on their body that would indicate struggle. Yes. All right. And when you looked at the autopsy photographs of Vicki Wegerly, was it apparent to you from those photographs that she had struggled with her attacker? Oh, very apparent. Go ahead, please. We're going to show two autopsy photographs of the conclusion. These will be of her face and head and neck. Okay, go ahead, please. 
All right. Can you point out some of those areas uh, in addition to the uh, ligature marks? There was, an, it, and it doesn't show up real well on the screen. There was an area of, of contusion, of bruising here by the, the right ear, uh, an abrasion uh, appears on her right jaw area, and then the ligature marks uh, are numerous, and it appears that there was uh, activity of ligature strangulation uh, that either was unsuccessful because of the fighting, more than likely and then areas where the strangulation would be reapplied, uh, trying to get a, a stranglehold on her while she fought. Another thing that you're uh, familiar with, you've had an occasion to uh, uh, observe on the skin, face, and the eyes of individuals who are uh, being strangled or, or lacking oxygen, uh, something that uh, shows itself in the form of what's called petechial hemorrhaging. Are you aware of that uh, indication? Yes, ma'am. It's probably not a very good way of phrasing it. Why don't you describe what that is? Petechial hemorrhaging is when the small blood vessels uh, in the face or in the eyes uh, begin to burst due to strangulation or asphyxiation. And Ms. Wegerly, from the photo, I did not see her in person in death. But from this photo, it appears that she has some petechial hemorrhaging on her right cheek, uh, which would be an indicator of strangulation as well. Thank you. Go ahead. We have one other photograph that shows uh, abrasions to her ear and head. If you'll just point to that. Yes, ma'am. There's a, a bruise and an abrasion here, and then some uh, more marked bruising here <coughs> behind the right ear. Uh, now, Lieutenant Landwehr had and Agent Morton from the uh, FBI had interviewed uh, Mr. Rader prior to the time that you interviewed him. Yes. And you're aware that during that discussion, he had uh, uh, talked to them about about this uh, happening to him, about her scraping him. Yes. All right. Go ahead, please. Now, we have a quote from his interview here where he's describing to you that she either scratched me, and then he says, I know you guys got some stuff on her fingernail. Yes. Now, that was because of his interaction with Lieutenant Landwehr, where that was discussed and described. That is correct. It's not because he knew it from something he read in the paper or anything like that. No, that was a uh, – the fact that we had found DNA under her fingernails uh, was not released publicly at that point. In fact, he invited you to sort of look, you know, at his head and face and neck area to see if you could see where that he is correct. scratched. Because he thought he might still have a scar or something? Yes. Did you do that? I did. I looked. I didn't see anything. Didn't see one. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we'll have – this is an autopsy photograph of only the left hand of Vicki Waverly. Okay. And uh, ultimately, as it turns in, in out, that this hand – it's a picture of her hand at the time of autopsy? Yes. And uh, fingernail scrapings were taken at that time? Yes. Now, at the time when these fingernail scrapings were taken in 1985, what was the purpose of doing that? In 1986, the, the I mean, technology for DNA was in its infancy. Uh, fingernail scrapings were taken as a routine part of a homicide autopsy because analysts would actually look microscopically for human skin under the fingernails to give them an indication as to whether uh, the victim was able to scratch or attack her. Okay, so they, they did a process where they scraped it out and saved it in a, in a tin. Correct. And indicated where it came from on the outside and sealed it. Now, so they're looking for, for skin, Correct. as you indicated. But if there were blood present, that would not necessarily be uh, useful to them at that time. You know, they probably could have done basic serology on blood. Uh, however, there was certainly not routine DNA testing in 1986. Okay. Go ahead, please. Go ahead. All right. So this happened September 18, 1986. Uh, Steve Ketches, who was with the Wichita Police Department for some time as a lab investigator, took and preserved those fingernail scrapings yes. from both of her hands, actually. Correct. But it turns out to be her left hand that caught the killer. Yes. 214 of the year 2000, uh, you were assigned this cold case review and you took those <clears throat> scrapings after looking at all the evidence in this case and realizing those were still there. You took those to the uh, Sedgwick County Regional Forensic Science Center for DNA examination. Detective Gadge and I took several pieces of evidence 
for DNA examination to the Science Center, including the fingernail scrapings. Okay. Okay. <coughs> then the next event uh, related to this is August 14th of 03, and Daniel Fanestock, who is a DNA analyst, uh, he notified you about what he had discovered, is that right? That's correct. And what did he discover? Uh, the DNA lab found unknown donor, unknown male donor DNA uh, from the fingernail scrapings from the autopsy. Uh, it appeared to be, to us, to be killer DNA. The killer's DNA was left behind. And that was, in particular, as we've said, the left hand. Go ahead. Then on April the 4th, um, April the 2nd, I'm sorry, of 2004, uh, you got another report from a different DNA analyst that works at the same location, Shelly Stedman. And what did she tell you? Lieutenant Landward had submitted uh, the blue robe from the Fox scene and other items for DNA testing from the BTK cold case. Uh, after the DNA examination was done on those items, uh, we learned that the DNA profile found on the Nancy Fox robe, unknown male donor, matched the unknown male donor from the Weggerly scene. Okay. And that was, when we're speaking of the blue robe, we're actually speaking of that blue nightgown that Ms. Folston had in here and was showing to Detective Ralph that had been had cutouts. Correct. Right. And that's where we found a match to this fingernail scrape. Correct. Go ahead. Then on just a few days later, the same analyst, Shelly Stedman, April 9th of 04, she uh, advised you of what? She contacted Lieutenant Landward to tell him that the rest of the BTK evidence was undergoing testing, and Lieutenant Landward had submitted, and that there was another match for DNA to the two items we previously talked about, and then the, the uh, basement floor of the Otero scene, the semen that was recovered from that scene matched our other two items as well. So we had a three-way match of DNA. Okay, so we have lab investigator Ron Eggleston, also had been with the Wichita Police Department for some time in that capacity, from the Otero crime scene. Correct. And that area of the floor shown by Kevin O'Connor in the picture when he was discussing with this with the KBI, uh, Mr. Thomas, I believe. Larry Thomas, that we could see that location on the floor where they had taken several DNA or swabs, not for DNA at that time, but swabbings to try to collect and preserve that evidence. Yes. And in fact, it was preserved to the extent by those that lab investigator uh, to that it made a match in 2004. Yes. Go ahead. Now, fast forward to February 25th of the year 2005 when Dennis Rader is arrested, uh, Detective Dana Gouch uh, uh, was asked to collect uh, swabs from Rader, is that correct? Yes. All right. And do you have knowledge of where that was done? And, and I have a word up there, it's sometimes called buckle or buccal swabs. Uh, and how does that process happen? And, and did you observe it happening with Rader? I did. Uh, Detective Gouch executed a search warrant we had for Rader's DNA on the date of his arrest. Uh, buccal or buccal swabs are simply oral cheek swabs taken with a long Q-tip. Uh, Gouge took those, several of those swabs from Raider, uh, took the cheek swabs pursuant to the warrant, uh, collected them, submitted them, and they were immediately taken to two separate labs for examination in comparison to our known DNA that we already had. Why take them to two separate labs? We used two labs uh, for verification purposes. We used our local Sedgwick County Regional Forensic Science Center DNA lab, and we also utilized the KBI lab in Topeka so that we would have two tests, same sample, uh, verification testing. Okay. And so uh, Shelley Stedman with the Sedgwick County Regional Forensic Science Center and Cindy Schuler with the Kansas Bureau of Investigation, also a DNA analyst, on February the 26th of 2005, began working on those samples that you had taken from Raider. Yes. And uh, can you de describe that they worked through the night, didn't they? They did, nonstop. All right. And uh, were they working together at all, calling up to see what your answer is? Not that I know of, but I wasn't there. Right. But I don't believe so. Did they uh, arrive at a, same, a, a similar answer? They did. All right. And that was what? 
that was in uh, very simple terms uh, the DNA match from all of those crime scenes uh, with Dennis Rader's no DNA and that he was the BTK killer. Okay. Go ahead. Now there's a thing that they do with DNA and that is a statistical evaluation. Yes. And they say what is the probability of selecting an unrelated individual at random from the Caucasian population. Yes. And at the Cedric County Regional Forensic Science Center they tested at 15 loci and what is that number? The, the statistical number given to us by Shelley and the people at the DNA lab here uh, or the odds of it being someone other than Dennis Rader to put it in very simple terms uh, would be one in 819 quadrillion people. Thank you. Now back to uh, Rader's version of, of how he uh, continued to uh, make sure that Vicki Weggerly was dead. What did he do? As it says on the screen, he, he got her down, continued to strangle her. He was able to get his hand on a nylon stocking uh, that was available there in a drawer in the dresser. He used that nylon stocking, wrapped it around her neck, uh, which he would state, would tell me, gave him uh, the added pressure that he needed uh, to take her down and put her down, and he killed her by strangling her. In fact, the uh, picture behind you, a crime scene photograph uh, taken of a, an open drawer there in her home where it appears that she kept pantyhose and socks. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, this is a graphic photograph. Uh, there will be two photographs. Uh, they do not actually show her face, but a portion of, of Vicki Wagerly's neck. Go ahead. Uh, this uh, shows the pantyhose at her neck. It does. In the manner in which they were tied, and then the next photograph uh, shows a different view of those strangulation marks or ligature marks that we've talked about. Yes, and, and just for information, the tape uh, here that's visible in both of the photos is from the medical treatment, the resuscitation efforts. It was not applied; at, it was applied by the medics. Okay. It is not part of the crime. Because there was some hope at that time that maybe they could save her. There was a, a, an extensive attempt to resuscitate her by the paramedics and by the emergency room physicians. Thank you. Now, uh, he, he started worrying about her husband coming home and describes it as a real nice mess. Yes, go. Uh, this photograph is of that bedroom floor that we really couldn't see uh, in the other picture, but you can see the dresser in the back. And this is where uh, Bill Weggerly found Vicki. Yes. All right. And go to the next one. These two photographs, also crime scene photographs, they show uh, those that hose that was there and the leather, uh, shoelace, and another a knife. Can you tell us about that? The, the uh, stocking and the leather laces wrapped around her, her head, neck, and mouth. Uh, Bill Wegerly used his own pocket knife when he found her and used that to cut those bindings from her, trying to save her life. Okay. Now, these uh, communications that Rader decided to send to various members of the media or uh, just tape on signs or somehow get to, the, to you, uh, he had sent a basically a black and white sheet of paper that was a copy of the Vicki Weggerly driver's license and three photographs taken of her at the time of her murder. Yes. Now, one of the things that was, those photographs were immediately recognized as most likely coming from someone who killed her. I think they had to come from her killer, yes. But you knew that early because at the time, uh, they had actually removed her out trying to save her life, as you've described, and no one had taken crime scene photographs of her laying on that floor. Yes, her, her body was not present in the house when the police arrived. There were no photographs uh, of the crime scene which contained her body. She had been transported out. And uh, behind you, this is uh, basically another copy for the screen that uh, indicates uh, that when it was sent, and as this communication was sent to her Slavia, or it was arrived at the Eagle, her Slaviana discovered it and, uh, and eventually turned it over to the police. Yes. Okay, go ahead. Now, in your discussion with them, because you had this sheet of paper of the communication, did you talk to him about taking these pictures? I did. And what did he tell you? I wanted to know if she was alive or dead in the photos. I couldn't tell. Uh, he said that he, she was dead. Mm -hmm. 
that there were other things he had wanted to do. He had certainly planned to do other things. He would brought the, the Polaroid with him for those reasons, but that everything had gone bad. As he said before, it was a big mess. Uh, so he had time to snap three quick photos, adjust her clothing in each of the photos uh, for sexual purposes before he took off. Okay, go ahead. And then he points at the first picture that you could see and, and tells you what? He, he changed her dress, uh, moved her clothing around, put a gag in her mouth after her death, uh, snapped those photos. Goes into a little more detail in his writings, but basically that's what he said. Uh, stuffed the gag in her, pulled her shirt up, pulled her pants down in different photos, okay. and then took off. Okay. Two graphic photos uh, showing her. And these photographs are uh, showing now are the Polaroids that you all collected when you searched his mother load, if you will. Yes. Now, his mother load is something that he kept. Where did he keep that? In his office okay. in Park City all right. at and City Hall. In a drawer? In a drawer. And these two pictures that he had taken, which have been, they have been changed so that uh, they are not as explicit as they were. There's been some brushing uh, in some private areas of Miss Wegerly. But these two, these two photographs show her after he had stuffed, as he said, the gag in her mouth. And then one shows how he pulled her pants down a little more, as he described to you. Correct. All right, go ahead. And then also you found... Her driver's license. Yes, her Kansas driver's license that had been missing uh, since the day of her murder. Okay, go ahead. Now, he tells you uh, this statement that is, as he was leaving, he could hear EMS. It, now, that can be quite right because of, of Mr. Wegerly coming. Correct. So what, what happened there? The, the, once again, the written document goes into more detail. Uh, basically, Rader tells me that he leaves the scene in Vicki's car. He goes west on 13th, and his plan is to start dumping evidence immediately, which he does. Uh, he stops behind a convenience store at 13th and West Street, dumps some items in a dumpster there, continues north on west to 21st, ends up by Sweetbriar, uh, dumps the rest of the physical evidence that he wanted to get rid of, and then uh, returns to the scene of the murder, returns to that area because he's going to dump Vicky's car close to the house because he's got to get back to his and as he is doing that, as he is dumping her car, getting into his vehicle to leave the area is when he hears the ambulance approach. Now, where had he left his vehicle? He left his vehicle, according to him, in the back parking lot of the Indian Hills Shopping Center, which is right across the street to the south from the Wagerly House. Thank you. Now, this uh, is a photograph behind you, also taken at that time, because police later discovered his... Uh, the Wegerly vehicle. Yeah, during while the officers were working the, the homicide scene, other officers obviously were canvassing the area and did find her car in the 1300 block of North Edwards, which is about two blocks to the west from the scene. Okay, go ahead. And this is just another shot, a little closer of that. Now, there is an added uh, text here uh, talking about uh, Bill Wegerly. Now, he was obviously interviewed after this extensively. Yes, he was. And uh, after, when you do a cold case review, you're looking back at things that people ask him and stuff. And, and uh, in your assessment of that, uh, did, he, uh, did he describe everything in, in detail about what, had, what he'd observed? Bill Wegerly's story to the detectives in September of 86 uh, as to what he saw on his way home uh, for lunch he had reported driving by and seeing what he believed was his wife's car, passing him in traffic with a male behind the wheel. Uh, he got a quick glance at it, uh, told himself that oh, that wouldn't be her car. It must be one that looks just like it. Got home, found her car missing, and then assumed that he had apparently uh, thought it was a male, but it must have been Vicky in the car. His story to the detectives in 86 matched Raider's story as to the direction of travel that he took when he left and that he was driving her car. They passed each other. So uh, upon questioning, you know, he starts telling them about this event. Yes. And the reports indicate an accurate description. Yes, he was accurate. Go ahead. Now, did you ask Raider a question about what would have happened? Because he said he'd heard the, you know, the sirens and stuff. 
Right. And what did he tell you? I asked him what he would have done had he been stopped by the police for a traffic violation for any reason. I wanted to see what he would say. And he said, oh, Jesus, and I thought about it a few seconds and said, I, I guess I'd hope I would be quicker with the gun than they would be referring to the police. That he would shoot the police? He would shoot the police, yes. Go ahead. And this is a, a video still that was obtained courtesy of, of Cake, but this is a film that has been out there being shown all the time. But this is an actual photograph of Bill Wegerly taking his his young son, Brandon, out of the home after police arrived. Yes, that was taken the day of the homicide. All right. The film was shot that day. Thank you. Now, he wanted to let you know that he did have, as you've indicated before, you referred to a written a piece of a, a document that he's written in longhand. Is that correct? Yes. And you've had an opportunity uh, to read it, obviously. You've been talking about it. And is this a copy of the first page of a nine-page, nine-page longhand story written by Rader describing the murder of Vicki Wagerly? Yes, it is. Uh, can you tell us, uh, after reviewing that, I, I don't want you to read the entire thing, but can you tell us if you've selected some things that you think are relevant to this hearing that the court has not yet heard <coughs> about the nature of Dennis Rader? I did select some things that I thought were relevant to this hearing okay. uh, from these nine pages. Okay. Would you go ahead and, and, and tell us about that or what uh, you have gleaned from that? To add to his, I hate to use the word credibility, but to add to the accurateness of his story and, and to match up with the facts of the murder, he describes the date, September 16, 1986. Uh, he begins his planning for the murder at about 10 a.m., according to his document. Uh, he decides and talks about that he has picked this house because it's a West Wichita victim, uh, talking about striking in the northeast part of town before, in the south central part of town, the southeast part of town. It's time for a West victim, uh, apparently, so he can spread that out. He lists the address of the Wagerly house. Uh, he has documented some of his stalking to the point where he knew that the husband or the man, if he wasn't sure which, uh, would sometimes arrive at lunchtime or in the afternoon. Uh, he lists a inventory of his kit that he brought with him, which included uh, some cord, a gag, a camera, a knife, uh, some gloves, uh, some wrap, some plastic bags, Vaseline, wire cutters, a pry bar, and his special strangling rig. Uh, he goes on to talk about uh, prior to murdering Vicki, he wanted to set a, a reason for him to be in the neighborhood. He didn't want to appear suspicious, so he made contact with an elderly couple who lived next door to the east of the Weggerleys, uh, which is verified by the neighborhood canvas that was done by officers in, the, in 1986, that he contacted them with his Southwestern Bell telephone repair ruse and did pretend to check their phone lines. Uh, it but was then if a, you go and, and contact Southwestern Bell since Raider didn't work for them, you would not find him. That is correct. And and the older couple next door were interviewed about any suspicious activity, and they did not mention the fact that a repairman showed up that day. However, they were, they were quite elderly at the time. Um, he describes the house and why he likes it because of the big, deep porch, and it sets off the street. When he makes contact with Vicki, he sees the small male child in the play area in the living room. Uh, when he makes his entry, pretends to check the phone, he pulls his gun out and uh, remarks and, and writes down that she was very scared. Uh, he demands her purse and the keys to her car prior to any other activity and gets those. Um, he says that as this is going on, as he's getting the items from her and holding her at gunpoint, the child is watching. Uh, he tells her that he's going to take her into the bedroom for sex. She becomes upset and says that her husband will be home at any time and begins to beg him to leave her be. He describes it as begging? Beg. He says, please, she begs. Once again, he quotes it. He gets her in the bedroom, um, tells her he's going to take these photographs of her and tells her to get undressed, and she begins once again begging him to leave her be. 
He reaches inside the briefcase and pulls out his strangler rig, at which point she begins a prayer. He then begins trying to strangle her, but the cord breaks on his strangler rig, and then she begins to fight him. She documents in here how she has scratched him on the neck and raked his neck with her fingernails. But he's able to get her down with the pantyhose and kill her. Um, he says, she is dying now. It took a long time to strangle her. I need to leave. Her husband may be home soon. Should I stay and kill him? Uh, he decides not to because things may get out of hand. Uh, he readies his camera, flips her over, puts her arms behind her back, even though they're not tied because she broke the bindings, and starts to take photographs of her. Takes the three photographs, which he, which he documents her body position exactly, and then the rest of the note describes how he left, how he dumped the evidence, what evidence he dumped, and that he then returned back to work. So he had actually thought or entertained the idea of waiting on Bill Waverly to kill him also. It certainly appears that way. All right. Now, he also had with this a, a diagram that he had drawn of, of his uh, movements and of the home and, and the body of, of Vicki Waverly as yes, he left. Yes, that was with his documents. Also with his documents. Again, uh, news clippings that he kept to remind himself of the murder. This is in the black binder in his mother load. Yes, and he had them all dated, as you can see. And finally, uh, he was uh, disappointed that he didn't have time to really enjoy this. Is that correct? That's correct. And this is a quote. Uh, he didn't really have time, and that's something he writes about, his regrets in that letter. Is that correct? Yes. P.J. Piano. Did he have an afterlife concept for uh, P.J. Piano? He did. And what was that? She was to be his bonded slave woman. I have another question, Steve. Bob? No, you're not. I mean, this be excused. Thank you, sir. You're excused. Thank you. State may call the next witness. State will call the next witness. Call your next witness, please. Uh, do you want me to do it? No, I'll do it.